reality, captured in user-friendly symbols and processed for understanding. The Idea Channel. Uh, Karen, people seem to be, at least the church seems, they seem to be somewhat suspicious of the operation of the free market. And, and indeed, many times they seem to be relatively hostile to uh, the, uh, the free market or what we sometimes call capitalism or laissez-faire. And I, I'm kind of uh, wondering why, you know, why do you see the church or people in the church uh, or ministers pushing for more government and government regulation of this, uh, government taxation and things like this? Well, I think, Walter, there are a number of reasons for that, but the overriding reason is that the church doesn't seem to be able to distinguish between, uh, pers between doing good through personal behavior and doing good through government. And there, partly I think that's a f consequence of the fact that Christianity especially really has no theory of government. They think of, of, uh, of the Christian injunctions to to feed the poor, clothe the hungry, take care of your love your neighbor, and they think the best way to take care of it is if people won't do it is to have government tax and spend in order to accomplish these purposes. I think that's kind of the crux of it. All the policies that you see church bodies and especially church hierarchies supporting mm -hmm. tend to be the kinds of things that you would think of as compassionate policies mm -hmm. or policies to help people without ever considering that there are unintended consequences to these policies that may hurt other people that they don't even know about. Or, or even uh, they, they don't consider the, uh, that they're acting against the admonition in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not steal, because uh, uh, it, it seems like unless you believe that there's a tooth fairy or a Santa Claus giving government the money, uh, the only way the government can give one American citizen one dollar is first through intimidation, threats, and coercion, uh, <laughs> confiscate it for, from some, of them, uh, some other American first. So, and I'm very sure that uh, uh, when Moses came down with the commandments, uh, that uh, uh, one of them being thou shalt not steal, uh, it didn't mean that thou shalt not steal unless you had a majority vote. And it probably also meant that you, uh, you shouldn't be a recipient of stolen goods. Well, and so there, there, well, I mean, I think that there's a, there, there is this problem of, uh, uh, of you know, whether um, uh, mora morality can be, is a, major a majoritarian thing. Uh, well, I don't think I'd, I, well, I, I guess what I would <clears throat> think is that most Christians wouldn't think of taxation as theft. They're not libertarians. And, mm -hmm. and uh, we have to be careful about invoking Moses. After all, there were all kinds of of, of uh, contributions and tithes that were owed to the church. I think the real problem is lots of times the church gets confused between itself and the state. Sometimes they still think they're in the Middle Ages where the church was one of the dominant political mm -hmm. powers and could affect its will. Uh, on the other hand, I think it's quite true that they don't seem to ever think about where wealth comes from. And if, if there's one um, overriding characteristic of a lot of ecclesiastical thought is that there's no conception that wealth is the product of human effort and that it requires a certain amount of, of human intention, planning, and as well as just sheer labor. And there, there is almost as if the way you raise wealth is to pass the plate on Sunday morning and it appears. Or, or either take it from somebody else because I believe that uh, somewhere in the Bible it says that is, it is as hard as a rich man to get into heaven as a, as a uh, camel to go through the eye of a needle. Yeah. Well, probably when that was written, uh, um, uh, people who were rich were probably guilty of something that is mm -hmm. taking, because, you know, be, pre, during, uh, during the pre-capitalism era, uh, many times when you be, did became rich, it came through pl uh, uh, plunder and yeah. looting. <laughs> But uh, with a free market, one becomes rich by serving his fellow man. Yeah. So, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, 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 a person being rich is evidence that he has served his fellow man, he has pleased his fellow man. And it seems like the church doesn't realize they still look at rich as being uh, uh, somehow connected with evil, I think. Well, there, there are two parts to that. And I think the first part is, I, I think you're quite right, when you... In, uh, pre-capitalist times, wealth often meant wealth because of power. Mm 
Uh, but even even the um, parable about the eye of the needle was wasn't to say that rich couldn't get into heaven. It's just that they would tend to be overwhelmed by their wealth and not mm -hmm. and want to serve the, their wealth rather than God. And I think that's a real problem, especially especially in a capitalist society where you can achieve great wealth. So I don't think as a as a question of individual moral principle that it's beside the point. But I do think there is a sense in which it isn't appreciated that wealth can come, as you say, or, or at least in, in markets must come as the consequence of serving your fellow man. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, and once again, here's the difference between individual action and unintended consequences. An individual could gain wealth by serving his fellow man by producing a product that would be abhorrent to right-thinking, mm -hmm. decent moral people. But he's nevertheless served the wants of some other people. Now, <clears throat> that's, that could be problematic for someone who wants to pass judgments on the market. On the other per hand, a person can become wealthy by serving the most fundamental needs that would be approved by everybody. But the fact of the matter is, there, you know, the, the market is in many senses neutral, and what comes out of it is the kinds of moral practices and beliefs that the practitioners bring to it. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's another issue here, and that is on the issue of motivations. Christians or Christian theology is, is or a moral principle is a principle of motivation or, or, or intention. Mm -hmm. You know, do you, in, do you intend an evil? And if you intend an evil, it's as good as, as accomplishing the evil. Yeah. Whereas an economist is concerned about the consequences. The effects, yes. Right. And we don't, you know, so if the guy's a creep, you know, uh -huh. if, if the consequence is that he served other people, then he's socially useful. We may disapprove him individually, but he serves mm -hmm. a function. And I think that's a distinction that's very difficult for some uh, theologically minded people to, to uh, understand. Yeah, I, I, yeah, they would say that, well, uh, Jonas Salk, uh, 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 regardless of what he did for mankind, if he did not mean, to, if he did not mean well, if he just meant to just get, accumulate more wealth for, him, for himself, they would kind of uh, discount his contribution a little bit. Maybe. Yeah, it would make it a little suspect. Although I think no one would, would argue that that wasn't a great benefit to mankind. But there mm -hmm. does seem to be kind of a um, a preference for things that are done out of out of um, the goodness of your heart. Out of the goodness of your heart, yes. rather than for money. I mean, what is one of the worst things you can say about a benefactor in our society? Oh, he just did it for the money. As yes. if there's something really tainted about that. And you know, I suppose partly that reflects the fact that when people do do something just for the money, they you feel like they might be likely to con you. Or, but uh, again, this brings up mm. another issue of the the discipline that a market mm. provides. For, mm -hmm. for individual actors. Even if someone might want to con you, as long as he's got competitors, he can't get away yeah. with it for very long. Or but even if you ask, you, if you take that line of reasoning from, uh, let's say, people in church or, the, uh, or people in general, and if you say, well, he just did it for the money, mm -hmm. well, uh, if, you, if you said, well, look, I can make a law where uh, people can't do things <laughs> just for the money, well, I doubt whether we'd eat because, I, I, you know, uh, Texas uh, cattle ranger, uh, ranchers, they don't give a hoot about you and I uh, <laughs> yeah. eating steak. They're just doing it for the money. Mm -hmm. And you can probably list a million uh, items uh, like that. And so I think that the argument would be very persuasive if you talk to a person, a religious person, and saying, well, look, uh, uh, most things that are good uh, that are done in the world are people do it just for the money. Mm -hmm. They don't really give a hoot about their fellow man. They're just doing it for the money. And you find all kinds of wonderful things done as a result mm -hmm. of that. Well, you could also argue it's not even a question of not giving a hoot. Sure. At one level, we all care. I mean, a, and, and at one level, a Christian does love his fellow men. But, you know, when you translate that into practice, just how much effort are you going to put out yeah. for who? And uh, that's where I always like the quote from the economist D.H. Robertson who said, love is a scarce commodity and the market mm -hmm. helps us economize on it. <laughs> right, or there's a downward sloping <laughs> yeah. for, for love. Yeah. Now, there's a, uh, you know, I've always felt that there was a, um, a very strong connection between uh, laissez-faire capitalism or free markets, we use those terms interchangeably a lot of times, uh, and religion, and, uh, and let's say particularly Christianity. Because the, uh, it, the morality of the market is that of serving your fellow man or trying to please your fellow man or trying uh, uh, better ways to help them out. You know, like uh, you, you find people like uh, Bill Gates, the, uh, the founder of, uh, of Microsoft Windows. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, he's a very, very rich man. And how did he become rich? Just by 
uh, trying to discover ways to uh, make his fellow man uh, uh, happier or to uh, ease his life, make things simpler or cheaper for him. Um, and uh, so, I mean, there's a, there, the market uh, has a lot of morality that's very consistent with uh, Christian principles, it would appear. Well, certainly when you consider it relative to the alternative. And again, that's the kind of thing. The alternative here on earth. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, at least I'm from the branch of theology that doesn't think you can bring the kingdom of God here on earth. <laughs> uh -huh. That that's something, uh, at least except in very small ways. But um, when you consider what the real alternatives are facing us, if we don't have markets, what do we have? We have authority directing us to do things. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that it should be pretty obvious that uh, the more you have authorities directing you, the more chance you're going to have for exploitation mm -hmm. and oppression. Churches have always a, a been opposed to oppression. It's just that they've tended, as some have tended to link oppress oppressive government with oppressive markets as if somehow economic power is the same thing as government power. Of course, that's not just Christians who do that. I mean, Marxists mm -hmm. have done that. A lot of, of liberals do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, a, it's a, a, a very widespread belief, but one that I think is, is just wrong, mm -hmm. that wealth that's earned through satisfying the demands of, of independent people who have a choice is wealth that's going to be created by doing at least what people perceive as good for them. Mm -hmm. Now, if you think that uh, there are some people on earth who know better what's good for you than others, then I guess you might want to get government to, to override <laughs> the market. But um, the history, we've had a lot of history with that kind of attitude, and it doesn't seem to have done the world very much good. That's right, and I think that um, one of the problems in, in, uh, in looking at the market and comparing it to, let's say, socialism or communism, mm -hmm. and that is, when people evaluate, including people in their church, uh, when they evaluate the market, they look at what currently exists here on earth with its warts and its problems, because uh, the market is not a utopia. But however, when they evaluate socialism, they look at the promises. <laughs> they never evaluate anything that actually uh, is, uh, is, is concrete that's here on earth. And I think that that poses a problem mm. just in kind of analyzing, mm. uh, the, the, you know, comparing promises yeah. uh, to that, that are never attained mm -hmm. uh, to what actually exists mm -hmm. on earth. And that makes, a, a makes for a difficult problem. Well, you know, it's funny. I wonder if that isn't changing. I mean, no one seems to want to provide an intellectual defense of communism anymore. No one seems to want to provide intellectual defense of complete socialism. But what you have now is an attitude, well, capitalism is flawed, socialism is flawed. What we really need is some sort of middle of the road. We need some sort of managed market. Mm -hmm. And uh, this sounds like a very comfortable attitude because then you can curb the excesses of the market mm -hmm. and, and provide the social agenda that's going to benefit humankind. And I think that's, in a way, a much more difficult argument to oppose because it takes the stark extremes that are useful for mm -hmm. comparison and leaves us with this with having to argue each thing on a case by case basis when it, when really the whole principle of of government control of specific instances of people's lives and choices it uh, is is um, not only dangerous it's not only a dangerous principle, but it, but it, it's a, it's one that has those unintended consequences that most people tend to ignore because they're consequences that come down the road. And here, this isn't just a problem of Christians or theologically minded or, or hierarchies in churches, but I think this is again a widespread sentiment that it's easy to see the evil here and now. Mm -hmm. than to see the, po the greater evil that can come down by trying to correct the so-called evil. Or, and it's also hard to see that you correct an evil by, by providing people more freedom rather than less. I mean, it, mm -hmm. it's counterintuitive. Yeah. So but you can't really blame Christians alone. I mean, this is a widespread attitude. Of human behavior in Yeah, general. except Christians but tend to support it more, I think, with the belief that they're doing, that, that they're going to try to do God's will and, 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 one, and use whatever is available to do God's let, will. Let me ask you, for, what, would, what would a, a uh, let's say, a church leader uh, consider, or what, people, what would people who are Christians consider excesses of the market? Mm -hmm. um, pornography. The, pornography, yeah. Yeah, the violence in, you know, in, uh, in TV. Of course, you know, we might mm -hmm. argue that TV is, is, is not exactly a pristine example of the free market. <laughs> uh, but, 
uh, um, tobacco. That, yeah. I mean, I'm sure a lot of um, sort of right-thinking people would think it's, it's horrible mm -hmm. to earn your money selling this deadly substance. Um, frivolous goods. I mean, I can't speak yeah. for everybody, but these yeah. are things that would occur to me that you could criticize as being excesses. Uh, or at least creating products that are not helpful. But there's another kind of excess, the kind that just drives you to do more and more and more. So they might point to someone like a Leona Helmsley, you know, as someone who is, is, is an excess of the market. You know, we, we might argue that, no, it's, she's engaged in criminal behavior. That's not an excess of the market. That's an excess of criminal behavior. Um, but uh, the, the, it, it's, it's not only the products that are produced, but I think it's also the kinds of behaviors where t people might, as they get caught up in their daily business, forget their obligations to God and their fellow man. Mm -hmm. And I do think there's something a little suspicious about someone saying, I'm working 14 hours a day you know, to make money and I'm doing all the good I could and I don't have five minutes to give my church or 10 minutes to give my kid or, or mm -hmm. you know, 15 minutes to give my neighborhood association. I mean, I can, I can see that that kind of person might be someone that the church would want to admonish. Mm -hmm. But that's a different but issue. But it's not harmful to society. No, that's a different yeah. issue from whether or not there's something systematically wrong with yeah. society. And I would argue if there's something systematically wrong with society, you don't cure it by just giving us more of the same system that's causing the problem in the first place. And, and some of the excesses, uh, or, or alleged excesses, aren't really that at all, because uh, some of them say, well, look, uh, uh, in a market produces uh, uh, this uh, bad distribution of income, that is, you have uh, uh, the great difference between the rich and, and the poor. Ah, now you're on one that really gets me. Yeah. The rich and the poor where we always have this dichotomy. And when we pray on Sunday morning, we pray for the poor, yeah. as if there is these, this identifiable group that are called the poor, they're always poor, and then there's this other identifiable group called the rich. Mm -hmm. There's nothing in between, and it's the rich's duty to give to the poor. I mean, it's such a pathetically poverty-stricken view of what mm -hmm. the real world looks like. I mean, there are whole gradations. They've never, they've, they've never mm -hmm. seen an income distribution curve or recognize the fact that the people in, who are poor move out of being poor and move up to being rich as they get older. And, and, and often the people who are rich <laughs> move down and being poor when, when they make bad decisions or they're mm -hmm. unlucky. So it's a very fluid group. And I've often wondered, I guess this is very, uh, very um, impious of me, mm -hmm. but during those prayers, I sit and figure out, now, where do I cut off the distribution? Where do, you know, to, to the poor or the rich? And, you, and the other question question that's never asked is how much? You know, how much do we give? How much of a government policy is enough? I, I got into a dispute with some some of my my fellow parishioners a, a year ago over funding for AIDS. Mm -hmm. And uh, the the um, local region of my church wanted to put forth a um, a, a statement saying that we supported increased funding for AIDS research. Mm -hmm. And I and and right before the governing body of our church agreed to that, I wanted to do some research, and I came back and showed that per 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 sick person per illness, mm -hmm. AIDS, was, AIDS was much more highly funded than you know. By some you, multiples. Yeah. By some multiples. By yeah. some multiples, and I said it's not that I was opposed to finding a cure for AIDS. It was a, you know a dreadful disease, and I thought we had a duty to show compassion to. Uh, to, to, to people who are suffering, but when it comes to lobbying the government for, for mo more money, shouldn't we consider the suffering of people with these other diseases? <laughs> and, uh, and I said, and, and how much is enough? And it was uh, astonishing that there were a group of people who just found that almost Offensive. as if it was immoral reasoning. Yes. And I, now to me, it's immoral not to reason that way because you can't solve one problem by making another one worse. It's immoral not to take the trade-offs into account. Those are the costs. You're giving up good that you could do in order to do something else that you consider good. You must weigh those goods. And that kind of reasoning I find very, a very short supply, at least in my church. And, and, yeah. I, and from what I've read, my church is not alone in this. That's right. And, and, and by the way, uh, uh, I'm very struck with people looking for a cure for AIDS because there is no cure. I mean, the, there's no virus that has ever been cured in mankind's history. But the going back to, but the uh, I, I think that speaking of AIDS, I think that one of the things that I note, noted uh, in churches, uh, uh, they focus less on individual responsibility uh, with not only AIDS because you know you, you don't just kind of happen uh, and get AIDS. You uh, for the most times you have to go look for it. And so the, uh, I've never heard 
uh, uh, or at least it's, uh, uh, I don't go to church every Sunday, but I haven't heard many pastors, at least on, the, on television, admonishing people for their behavior. Mm -hmm. This is the same thing with the homelessness. Churches uh, are trying to help with homeless, uh, and you, you don't hear them admonishing uh, 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 people for their behavior. In other words, what I'm saying is that the church has moved away from its position some years ago of holding people accountable for their behavior, and instead saying, well, the government is responsible for doing something. Or they're victims. Or know. they're victims of society. Yes. And, you know, and I think this, this theology of victimization, if I can call it that, is, is again one of the real dangers in modern society. Now that's, this isn't to say that people can't be victimized. It isn't to say that some people can't be homeless out of you mm -hmm. know, no, no fault of their own. And we all know that circumstances are, mm -hmm. and luck is important. But um, I think you can both show compassion for the suffering person and recognize that there were behaviors that had consequences. And, and to, you know, to ignore the fact that behaviors have consequences is to depersonalize that human being. Make him less a child of God rather than more. You make him a child of the state rather than a child of God if all you do is treat him as a victim and want the state to bail him out. A child of God is given a soul and is, and, and, and is, and is given a will and that will is, is, is to be used to serve God's purposes, and you tell him, none of that applies to you, you're a victim, what are you, what are you telling that person about his relationship to God? Or so, you're, so, you're yeah. telling him nothing, he's nothing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's uh, just uh, laying out on the sea, yeah. he's victim of, uh, of uh, influences, he has no control over his life. Yeah, and and it, it's more than an issue of having un, unintended bad consequences for the federal budget, which I think is pretty is bad enough, or having unintended consequences uh, for, you know, for neighborhoods. These have unintended consequences for that person's conception of themselves as a human being. And uh, that, you know, it, getting, that takes us back to you know, your, your question about personal responsibility. Now, to say we're personally responsible doesn't mean we control everything. We don't control everything, but we have an obligation to do the best we can with what we have. Okay, so, um, so in conclusion, what can what can the church do? I mean, what I mean, what would you say to uh, uh, ministers? Now, I know that's a big question. I could start another conversation, but <laughs> do we have an but hour. If, but if, but if, if you could if you could say it in a, in a sentence or two, uh, what? Uh, I've thought a lot about this. I mean, I'm an economist, uh -huh. and I sit in a church every Sunday, and I listen to sermons, and I read the publications that come out, and I've thought a lot. Of, First of all, how to explain my arguments to people who are not economists, but also what would I do if I had to direct, it's not really policy, but direct or, or, or change the, the emphasis within churches. And I think the, the thing that I would emphasize is preach to the individual about his own behavior. Preach to the individual about his responsibilities vis-a-vis -vis his neighbor and his family. And, and, uh, teach a, and, and preach to a person about our own shortcomings and sinfulness and our own mm -hmm. and, our, and the needfulness of our own humility and then take by by giving people a sense of what is honorable behavior then leave the social policy to these individuals to come together in a civil community mm -hmm. I mean and and when then you can try perhaps this is this is this is a little bit optimistic on my part but it seems to me that if you if individuals start off with a sense not only of of uh, a, a need to be responsible but also a sense of compassion and humility that the social policies will emerge from those kinds of people are going to be better social policies I don't whenever the church starts mixing up in, in politics and telling people that this policy is a good one and that one's a bad one they make mistakes because they're human like because the, the policy makers within churches are humans like everyone else mm -hmm. and they have less often um, understanding of economic realities than say the typical economics professor who might not know a whole lot about personal responsibility <laughs> and humility That's right. so yeah I guess it, you know I think the, the shift in emphasis away from from the personal morality towards social morality has been only at the cost of the authority of the church. That's right. Well, thank you very much.